The British pound hit an all-time low this week, while the British government's borrowing costs surged. It's been less than a month since the Queen passed away and the new Prime Minister was sworn in, and a crisis of confidence is already rocking the British economy while the weary world market watches on. What has precipitated this capitulation in British assets? Why the crisis in the UK may be a harbinger of what's to come elsewhere? What does it mean for your money? Hi, I'm David Wu, a former Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about major global change. Welcome to The Money Game, where I take on groupthink, propaganda, and conspiracy theories in my critical analysis of markets, economics, and politics. Four weeks ago, in a video entitled Britain Under List Trust, I made the case as to why the new British Prime Minister and her ideological approach to economic and foreign policies could bring ruin to the British economy. I have to say, I'm not too surprised by what's transpired since. Nevertheless, I've decided to come to London to find out what really is going on on the ground. And what better way to find out what's going on than to talk to people who are in the know and whose opinions I trust. I have the great pleasure of um, inviting a bunch of very special, especially the opinionated but well-informed people to join me to talk about United Kingdom today, the future of the UK. And uh, they're all, each in their own way, very successful. But most importantly, they are willing to actually come and share their honest perspective. And by the way, they come from different walks of life. So from that point of view, we hope to basically really get a, a holistic view of what really is going on. To my left, we've got Tara Glenn. Tara, Oxford educated engineer, who manages a hundred million pound business that imports machine rigs into the UK. Nigel Whitaker, study economics at London School of Economics. Lund I mean, Nigel probably is one of the most successful traders, fund managers, specialty specializing in emerging markets. So Ross Moosen, <coughs> one of the most senior women working in the city. 30, after a 30 year career as a managing director at Merrill Lynch, she recently set up on her own to create a her own venture capital firm. Michael Warsh. Michael is from Texas. He, he studied, guess what? Russian studies at Columbia University under Brzezinski before he decided to throw himself into the world of finance. He was once one of the biggest trader, if not the biggest in the foreign exchange market, managing money for one of the largest uh, sovereign wealth funds in the world. He's now setting up his own hedge fund. And then we've got Tuggy, who is our master of ceremony, who owns this wine shop, who's actually been here for 40 years, believe it or not. Tuggy is very opinionated and he's very well read. I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say as well. You know, the last few days, the UK has been very <coughs> much in the focus with the pound collapsing, with guilds collapsing. There's a sense of crisis here. I think, you know, that hasn't been seen for many, many years. So the question is, of course, you know, is this real? Todd, do you think the market is overreacting to actually the, you know, the new prime minister and her new economic policies? I think they do need to give her a chance, for sure. Um, running a business in the UK um, and hearing what the statement was on Friday, it's the other half of the statement that's missing so far. Um, so it's probably not, a, not surprising that they reacted so dramatically. But we need, need now to see what the policies are which are going to support the tax cutting that they've announced, which we do welcome as, as a business owner. But I would like to see um, other things on the education side and skills side and productivity side. And I was disappointed that productivity wasn't mentioned and given a bigger headline. The market's not going to give you time. I think um, they've demonstrated by the announcements that they are a bit gung-ho and the market doesn't like it. And it's all set against a backdrop, which is very dollar positive, and that's exasperating the problem. So I think um, when I look at it and the way I've been waking up feeling in the morning from a trader's point of view, my gut feel tells me we're in trouble. The biggest difference now than say 30 years ago is that if, if you had to pick one central bank in the entire developed market universe that is ill-equipped to handle this crisis, you would be hard pressed not to pick the Bank of England. Wow. Why is that? It's not because they're incompetent or they don't know what they're doing. 
it's because their messaging has been very poor. I'm choosing my words, you know, care carefully. Uh, I could be a little more dramatic with the language, but they have given the market several head fakes. They have um, the market lacks confidence in their ability to act decisively, and decisive action is what it would be needed, and it's probably what Liz Truss and I'll call him KK. I love that. Have have uh, counted on. We know from the last. Um, meeting that there are three different perspectives on the on oh. the committee, not two, three. They needed to make a statement. What they said was, let's just wait till the next meeting, see how things look, which is the probably the opposite of what you should have been saying. But they're not focused in a way that the market is is forecasting their the their rate path. So that brings me back to to the to UK rate path, even less so, right? So I, I looked before I came here. I think between now and end of the year, it's 245 beeps of hike, 243. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that happening. Mm. They're not strong-willed enough and cohesive enough to make those decisions on the rate path. And I think that's, that's where the, ty the tire can't quite stay on the road kind of thing, you know, the and one more, I'll say one more comment, and that, that going along with that is, is that, so you mentioned 92. 92 was really the fallout from Lamont and his terrible 88 decision, okay? Well, wh where did rates go? 15%. Do you think that the Bank of England can even get to 5% in this climate? I don't think so. So that, that's me, but... I, I think, by the way, I think, I think that's exactly right. I, mean, I think for me, you know, I mean, we can talk about whether, you know, the tax policy is the right policy for the UK in the long term. I think the short term, there's no question, I think the timing is very poor. Because let's remember, UK is the only major economy right now with double digit inflation. And they just decided to basically add fat to the fire. So from that point of view, it's like, well, inflation, already people are starting to be concerned like whether inflation will ever come down in the UK. With this amount of stimulus, it's almost certain that inflation is going to stay up for longer. And meanwhile, the economy is going to a recession, which means that the <coughs> Bank of England is caught between a rock and a hard place. I mean, do you fight inflation? <laughs> what do you basically fight basically next yeah. recession? And I think this is why the uncertainty premium has gone through the roof in the market, because people understandably don't basically don't know what the Bank of England is going to do. We were very much aware of Liz Truss's stance and approach if she was going to, if, you know, if she was going to win the leadership election. She won it. She came in. She put her team in and she did what she said she was going to do. And for markets to suggest that that's not true, I think is a little bit far-fetched. Um, I think Nigel's right, <coughs> the backdrop of a strong dollar. If you look at what was happening to sterling, the Japanese yen, emerging market currencies, up until Thursday afternoon, every single currency, major trading currency in the world, had already weakened against the dollar. But, the, know, the, but the problem is now, it's out of the bottle. Yes, yes. And, Genie's out of the bottle. And once it gets ugly, you, when you look at the plus and minus on the balance sheet, you go back to the people. Yep. Then you look at the government side and you think they're only there because, you know, the, the, the strings are being pulled by the RG and it's the agenda. And we all know that trust will move with the wind, like, you know, attack like a yacht down the estuary, mm. you know? And hence, <clears throat> it's fine when it's going well, but now you've got a really tricky situation mm. which you come back to the character and the standing and the strength and the almost emotional intelligence skills of a person to get you out of a problem. Mm. That's why I'm bearish. Because as far as I can see, they do not have it. And the price action, forget whether where the base rate's going. I was on track before I come in here. Gilt's 30 years, 5% when I walked in the door. Yeah. OK, that's ugly. Now, you may think I'm being completely sensationalist, <laughs> but that type of price action, exponential, what you get to get to that point. If I was not, if I was looking at that chart and I was given the facts, I'd say next lot 10. Because that's what I've seen in the past. 
is there is no there is no logic if there's an illiquid market people lose confidence that the people can't sort themselves out and the institutions are being questioned you can't you know you can't poke the wastefulness of inequality the way they've just done it the interviews after he did that statement were calling everyone plodders okay the plodders who do the nhs the mm. plodders who have this job the plot i mean a lot of the bloody plodders what, where would we be without plodders we're not all venture capitalists or we're not all hedge fund guys and all yeah. investment bankers you can't be little people and I, did, I was looking at strike action because I grew up in the, I lived through the 70s, went through the whole shooting match and, you know, there was w that one year where 30 million working days were lost to strike, strike action in one year, in the winter of discontent. We haven't even started here yet yeah, yeah, because people fair, yeah. are going to get <clears throat> pissed, you know. I think the bigger picture for me is very clear. Why is the dollar so strong? Why is the euro so weak and the pound is now collapsing? I think obviously we all know the main reason is because of the economic sanctions against Russia, right? We all know that Europe has signed up to America sanctions against Russia. And there's no doubt the sanctions against Russia are hurting Europe much more than it's hurting the U.S. because U.S. is more or less independent. The war is very far away. You know, Russia is barely a trading partner for the U.S. Whereas Europe, Europe is dependent on Russia for its energy. You know, U.K., you know, Germany, you know, Russia was a major market. And now basically the Russians are completely gone. Putin, by mobilizing his reservists last week, is basically telling us he's taking all gloves off and there is no doubt, it's very clear in my mind, people are delusioned and thinking that the Russians are going to be defeated tomorrow and the war is going to be over. So what the Europeans have yet to really accept is that the longer this war goes on, basically Europe is going to be the biggest loser in this, especially Brexit. British are probably the most talented, most accomplished people in the world. You know, and I thought that I supported Brexit because that once UK breaks out from EU, it can go its own way, it can do whatever. But Britain has to make friends with the rest of the world in order to maximize the opportunity of Brexit. Now it's like your UK is basically fighting a war with friends with EU over the Northern Ireland Protocol. It's fighting, you know, Trust wants to designate China as an official threat to British national security. Britain is leading the call to destroy Russia, you know. As a result, all of a sudden, what? So where is, Brit how is Britain going to grow its export? Exporting more to Australia and New Zealand? These are small countries, you know, there were for 20 years, Coup Britannia, London deregulated its financial industry, all the bankers came here and, you know, a lot of people made a lot of money driving up house prices and so on and so forth. And while that lasted, it was great. And then Britain said, you know what, we reject that basically business model. We're now going to give up, okay, you know, London as the center of finance for Europe. In exchange, we're going for Brexit. And now... The whole basically slew of changes that adjustment that Britain will have to go through to make Britain a success mm -hmm. is actually a very, very long term process. And I don't know if anybody basically thought it through. 20, and so 25, far, 25 years. It's 25 years. Yeah. But you know the what? The question is, you know, are we going to end up in a good place in 25 years? Maybe we will. But maybe we're going to end up in a bad place first before we get up the good place. Well, of course you know, we will, I, because there's always that, you know, well, it used right. to be six, seven years, that cycle up and down. As I say, at my age, nearly 60, trust me, I've been through quite a few of them. Yep. You're a big importer, okay? Now, sterling has collapsed, which means that your cost of import is going up. How are you able to, are you able to pass on the higher cost onto your customers? And also, I want to ask you, to, to what extent, because you import a lot of, you know, you know, sort of machinery, fairly sophisticated stuff, which the UK no longer produces. I mean, at what point sterling becomes so cheap that people say, well, instead of importing this stuff from wherever it's coming from, we're going to start making it here in the UK. After all, this is a country that started industrial revolution. So do you think a weak sterling could be potentially the answer to basically restoring competitiveness for the UK economy? As a British engineer, I'd yes. love to see us make more stuff. But we need the government policies, which is what I keep asking for. I think every answer I've given tonight is asking the government to come out with some really supportive policies on skills and productivity. Um, they really need to make dramatic changes there and get, the, as the kids leave school, 
get them pointed at the right the right places for those skills. You forget. I'm I'm sorry for those arts people out there watching this, but you know, forget about um, promoting people into history degrees. We we do need some historians, but we need a lot more engineers. We need people with technical skills. We need people who I don't know why coding isn't taught as compulsory mm. subject mm. in school. You know, how is this country going to lead the world in things again, which is what I'd love to see it do, if we don't have those skills that we need? Do you feel like there's a shortage? No, I, I don't feel. I know there is. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, all the positions I have that are not filled at the moment are technical positions. Right. right. So you're saying that basically talking about Briggs is easy. So far, the government has not done anything to prepare the economy for Brexit to the extent that, you know what, they knew Brexit already happened five years ago. They could have started to change their program to get more people, you know, basically trained as engineers to get the whole economy ready. And then yet, you know what, nothing is being done. Would you say until now, very little I, has been done? If you want me to give a small piece of credit to someone, the one thing that Boris Johnson did do was that the Innovate funding was increased in about the last 12 to 18 months. When you look at the stats, it's, it's quite interesting. You know, 800,000 businesses were registered in the UK between in 2020, 2021. Wow. Now, those are new businesses that they range from, you know, one person registering a company to, you know, 15 people who have got an idea and who are going for it. But what we see through the associations like the BBCA, the UK, British Angel Association, etc., is a huge growth in the seed, sub-seed, post-seed sort of ecosystem. Um, last year we must have seen nearly 500 businesses, this year to date we've seen nearly 200. There's a very strong horizontal of tech that runs through all of the businesses here and if you look at the numbers, you know, technology driven businesses, AI and quantum computing was you know, outside of the US, the UK was the number one geography globally in, in, in sort of establishing those companies and then, you know, selling those and, and, and getting investments, particularly from the US. So from our perspective, it's all about whether what has always been a very nascent venture capital business in the UK, whether we can catch up with the, U, with the US. I mean, valuations are a third in the UK compared to the US. And the reality is this, and this we know as a fact, which is 21 of the 50 best engineering schools in the world are now in China, according to the U.S. Mm -hmm. News World Report. And I think from that point of view, I think, you know, like, I understand now, you know, trust wants to basically, again, label China as, you know, official threat to British national security. Mm -hmm. But the real threat <coughs> is the fact that basically in the West, I think, you know, governments, whatever, they decided to let go when it comes to education. That, you know what, you go to Oxford and Cambridge to read history or philosophy, as opposed to go study engineering at Warwick, whatever. And that people, governments deliberately have abandoned manufacturing, you know, basically 20 years ago in the UK, in order to basically build up basically the city, we want to basically become a service industry and so on and so forth. The question is trying to regain that skill set and the focus and it's gonna take forever. I mean, the question is, again, it is it going to be enough time? It can't take forever. It can't. Yeah. <laughs> no, but... I know but, it cannot but, take forever. The question is, <laughs> it, it, do people have in long enough patience, okay, for this to play out before we go down a very bad path? But if you're right? going I mean, big bang with taxation, if you're going big bang with planning, if you're going big bang with whatever kind of the ideology, to your point earlier, it is ideological. I think whatever you say, the UK... I mean, we are, pra we are pragmatists, but I think what has been implemented yeah. is an ideo ideological framework that was developed many years ago, like you say. But it, why can't we have that with education? Yeah. Why can't they sure. say, That's true. in January, this is what's going to happen? Every child in the United <coughs> Kingdom is going to have uh, six years of coding. I think the reason why the UK is so interesting for the rest of the world is because, in some sense, UK was the first to reject globalization, right? Because you know, that's what Brexit ultimately was about, right? Because globalization turned London into this international hub, mm -hmm. cosmopolitan city, because of the financial industry that really benefited from globalization and made a lot of people rich, but they're mainly bankers. 
So the rest of the country was left behind. Manufacturing died slowly. And that was what the Brexit vote was really about, which is that we had enough with basic globalization mm -hmm. making one class of people rich. We want to basically bring back UK manufacturing, so on and so forth. But what I'm saying is that what you're saying is that that's a very long process. You know, to, to talk about bringing back manufacturing is easy, but really execution is very, very long term. And clearly the government hasn't even really been going down that path. Now, innovation is good, but people who are in the innovation industry, you know, it's a very, it's not a very labor intensive industry. It's not an industry that's going to be hiring millions of people. <laughs> You but know? do not underestimate, David, what is happening within the universities in the UK. I mean, there are hubs which are, you know, led by Cambridge and Oxford. We know that. That's well documented. And then, but, but that is now spreading throughout the UK. So, for example, in the south of England, um, the seven major universities, you know, Exeter, Bristol, Plymouth, Southampton, the, 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 the big seven have got together to make their own VC fund called Set Squared, which is based in London. And they are raising capital to push into the universities, into these eco labs, where students, you know, postgrad students, final year students are coming together to innovate. You're right. It's not a huge, um, you know, employer of, of people, but if we're talking about skill base and technical innovation, it is happening at grassroots level. Probably not fast enough, Tara, from, from what you were no, describing. Not, not fast enough, and I also, I mean, the, the, the education piece is, is massive. Yeah. Um, because I also struggle with the, the number of foreign students that there are in the UK. I absolutely understand the economics behind it, and I also understand the, if you like, the diplomacy behind it as well. And it's great if, if people want to come and be educated here and, and, and in, end up enjoying our country. But they're taking up places that the British students can't then take up. Mm -hmm. And no one in government's even started thinking about it's that. E it's an even bigger problem in America. You have 350,000 uh, Chinese students in American universities, for example, many of them taking spots that would not go to uh, Americans. And you have to ask yourself, like, really? Why? I mean, it's, I, think, I think that that's, that's the, the real conflict. <coughs> this is, I think this is why you know, Trust and Maloney and uh, people have come into power and why I think there'll be a regime shift in America at the, in the midterms and in the 24 election because people have seen the globalists, you know, more aware, you know, well, you know, you know, they've seen that and what it's done to the countries and their competitiveness and putting, effectively putting your own people second and, and when, yeah. it, which is, suicide in the end, unless you're a real globalist who believes that that's what we should be doing. I mean, I think a lot of you guys are basically member of the Conservative Party and so on and so forth. So I know you are, you know, you are actually a, a member of the Conservative Party. I know you are too as well, Tara. But I was just wondering, like, wh so were you surprised that Rishi Sunak, you know, who seemed to be a more qualified candidate than Liz Truss, why do you think he lost, you know, in the, um, in the final, you know, basically uh, analysis in, in the runoff between her and Trust? Yeah, I mean, I look, I think that the rhetoric is clear. You know, it's been well reported. I mean, I'm, you know, to be, to be completely blunt, I mean, I'm not sure, you know, the Conservative Party was ready to elect a sort of person of colour as their, as their leader to be the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. I'm not sure it was, and it was quite interesting because actually I did go to, to the London hustings um, and I was, I was there in the crowd when Trust was introduced by Duncan um, Smith and you, we had um, uh, Michael Gove introducing <coughs> Sunak and I, and I have to say, I was actually astonished that, you know, Trust is a very, you know, she's a smart woman, but you know, Sunak is a fantastic speaker. He's eloquent, he's warm, he had the crowd. You know, there were people going mad, he had standing ovations. I mean, I, I, was, I was taken aback. Well, I think, you know, the, the, what was said within the Tory party is that once it went to the members, he, he had lost. Jackie, are you here? Where's Jackie? I didn't think she was, she was going to be here. Donald Trump was very enthusiastic, but you know what 
but Britain was not out of the EU yet, so the, they couldn't officially start basically a uh, negotiation and free trade agreement with the US yeah. until Trump basically actually left office. Now, would you say, why do you think Biden is holding out on basically on the UK? All I know is that the first conversation Biden had with Trust, he scolded her and said, don't you basically even yeah, so try to throw out the Northern I I Ireland basically I protocol. I mean, from that point of view, is there any chance basically, you know, that, 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 yeah, that Biden, I, the I, Americans are gonna give her a gift? Okay, a free gift. Yeah, no, I, I, I think like, um, no chance. Yeah. And I'll say why. Because uh, there are two reasons. One, because Biden has this kind of, he's harking back to this kind of faux Irish heritage thing that a lot of Americans, as you know, probably, you know, they, they've never, they don't, you <laughs> if know. They, if they have an Irish terrier, they think they've got Yeah, Irish exactly. So, so Biden has harkened, his, he talked about his mom a lot and his mom's family and the whole thing. So that's number one, which is why he was, very glib in the beginning about the Northern Protocol and things like this, and you know, in sticking his nose into areas he probably sh shouldn't be sticking it into. So that's number one. Number two, though, is that is 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 the fact that my ex my observation of the Biden administration is that from day one they have been determined, almost uh, just like like crazy people, uh, obsessively to go against everything Trump. Everything Trump. Trump would have done this deal. They're not going to do it. Trump wanted to have, have energy independence. They've been waging war against, against oil and gas since day one when they closed Keystone and he issued 18 different executive orders saying you can't do this, you can't uh, uh, drill on, you, on federal lands, you can't have new plans, all this stuff, right? So I think those two reasons are why you won't get it. And it's also not on his priority list. It's certainly, and when I, by that I mean it's not on the priority list of Susan Rice and of Ron Klain and the people who are actually behind, the Obama people behind the throne, so to speak. Um, that's actually a great topic. How will relations be the UK, the special relation of UK and US going forward? I would say they can be quite crappy, okay? Biden and his group will have no interest in engaging meaningfully with a, what they see as a neoconservative, anti-globalist, right-wingish, you know, trust in her and her and her ilk, you know, as they no, would say. No, but she's doing. They the don't do, care. She's she doing care. the dirty work for the U.S. with Russia, I think, in in many ways, because the U.S. is yeah. quite far away. No, Boris did the think. dirty work. <laughs> no, no, he started and she, for sure. And she's kind of inherited no, this. No, she, but she's not going to back away no, from that. No, she won't, so because the US they're, they're, is very, they're too committed. They've got, yeah. they've got $5 billion exposed. I agree, already. I agree. I mean, Worldwide, you know, I think, you know, like young people, I think they have lost motivation because they feel like, you know, they can work 24 hours a day and they will never ever be able to get on the housing ladder. Yeah. I mean, the UK obviously, you know, home ownership is very high. So from that point of view, the Brits like owning basically the roof over their head. So from that point of view, the sense like, well, I'm completely priced out, you know, therefore I don't even know what to do with myself. I'll just basically watch TV all day. I'm not gonna push myself very hard anymore. You wanna basically elaborate a little bit more about that. I mean, to what extent do you think that this really an important aspect of the British psyche? I mean, and then how would that play out? I think you know? it's a, a phenomenal importance. I mean, as soon as you go above that sort of 35% uh, to put into a mortgage or even rent, then your disposable income just declines. So you're talking about, you know, how you're going to spend your way out of it. But some of these people, they're never going to be able to spend their way out of it. They're just, you, you know, I mean, at, uh, pre the Lehman crisis, even bankers that I know, some of the names of banks I've heard here, is that they were spending 80%, 80% of their salary as a young banker uh, on a mortgage on a, a one bed flat. So, mm -hmm. you know, really with those sort of equations, what, chance, what chances have you got? And even if you say, oh, forget it, rent, but here's, here's the problem is rent is uh, dictated just the same as any business basic cost yeah. is from the freehold value. So that's gone up, rent goes up. And you take a given area and you have this domino effect. You can't afford Kensington, so sorry, goodbye. You move to Fulham, you can't afford Fulham, you move to Wandsworth, you can't afford Wandsworth, you move to Tooting, you move to Croydon, and you go down the scale.
I have to ask one final question around the table, right? I mean, for me, I, I you know, listen, I never thought, you know, I, I never thought I was going to love the Queen the way I did. You know, having lived here for 10 years, having watched her, I was like, wow, this woman is amazing. Because she understands her role in life, which is a symbol. Like, monarchy is a symbol. So, to be a perfect symbol for the British people, she had to basically, you know, show herself to be, you know, basically responsible to her duty, country first. She may not be the greatest mother to her own children, grandchildren, but she was definitely the best mother you can have for the British people at the end of the day. Now she's gone, right? You know, basically, you know, trust is in, right? A new era. Child is in. The question is, do you think, I mean, this is a question I have because the survey that was conducted actually a few months ago before the Queen passed away was that, you know what? Only 60% of British people were in favor of monarchy, I'm right? Guessing, Which I'm is guessing, much lower than it was basically for the previous 20, I'm 30 years. I'm guessing it's now, what, 75 yeah. So my question to you is, do you think, you know, everybody around the table, do you think the British monarchy can survive the passing of the Queen? Uh, certainly in the short term, no question. But it does depend on the quality <coughs> of what Charlie actually does. So uh, but potentially, unequivocally, uh, that's it, the theory. In practice, we will have to wait and see. Depends how good a job she, she did. You know, it's only in hindsight when we lost her, you realise actually what the Queen collectively did over those those decades. No, I think everybody she, knew, like she was the yeah, very but, remarkable yeah, but, yeah, person. Yeah, but you, you, know, no, you, take, you take it for granted. At okay. the time when Diana died, and people said, you know, come on, where are you? Um, there, there was a lot of uh, uh, disapproval. But uh, it's extraordinary, you look at the people just in the queue, just right across the board, uh, ordinary people were moved to extraordinary levels, you know. So, but it, it's, Charles has got to step up to the plate. Yeah. Yeah, Nora, what do you think? What do you think? Do you, you think the British monarchy is going to be going to stay for the next 20 years? I absolutely, it absolutely. is. Absolutely, okay, yes. fine. No, no. Okay. 20 years, no, definitely. No, okay. 20 years, I'm talking about like Charles, I don't know, like, you know, how old is it going to be in 20 years time? It's going to be 90 something. Yeah, 94. Right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. fine. So you think that, you know, regardless of who Charles turns out to be, what that you think that Charles is going to be a great king? Like his mother I mean, was. That's a, a very queen. different question, and, yes. and and that's what Toggy just said: is he has to prove to us that he can be a good king, right? Been a great king, right? But the institution of the monarchy, yes, it is. Um, it's a cornerstone of, of, of Great Britain and, and Northern Ireland, and it's you know it, it's so many people turned out to support not only um, her, her Majesty and the Queen, but but also the institution of the monarchy. Yeah. I think of course, trust was obviously anti-monarchy, right? She wanted to abolish monarchy. I mean, you, I think was you yeah, yeah, but when she was at university, friend. look, I mean, sure, no, yeah. most people at university yeah. are socialists, let's be honest. Right, so right. Most people, when they but, get to old age pension, right. are conservative. <laughs> so you change somewhere along the line, David. Right, you know, right. When did you change? But well, I, Andrew, what, what do you think? I mean, do you think, you know, the British monarchy is just as here to say? No, I, I think for 20 years, yes. Uh, there is just total indifference amongst the younger generation. And if I'm right about the way the UK will be seen in the world from an economic standpoint, we just aren't what we used to be, we can't afford the services we used to have, then I think people will get more and more sort of um, resentful of privilege. I, I, I would say just one thing. Yeah. I think what we can all agree is that great leaders are very rare. Yeah. Yeah. And the Queen is gone, and she was one of them, yes. okay? And unfortunately today, and not just in Britain, but everywhere else, the world is facing probably the biggest crisis it's done in decades. Yes. Mm -hmm. And right now, you look around, politicians either are ideological, or they're naive, or that they simply are not that right. And this is probably the greatest right. worry, and whether it's in Britain, or the US, or in Germany, or yeah. anywhere else for that matter, in China. Venice so from that, that I think exactly, yeah. I think that is the, the lack of leadership, yeah. you know, in a very critical time when the world is trying to make a big adjustment, when wars are breaking out, inflation, recession, <laughs> social unrest. You know what? I think what is most worrying for me is the lack of leadership. Correct. That's and I think, you know, 100%. that I think is sort of the biggest takeaway for me from this basically a gathering. And I wanted to say thank you so much for joining me. I learned a great deal. I hope everybody, you know, basically at home watching this program, hope you got something out of this, whether you live in Britain 
or somewhere else. Because I think, you know, the, these are real people talking about real life in a real country in one of the greatest countries on earth. On that note, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.